Good morning. This is Bill from out of Europa, Naples, on an only slightly muggy Florida Tuesday. Yeah, I'm going to put up with it. It's, uh, you know, it's it's more humid than it should be. It's going to be like 85 today, which absolutely, again, sucks. But um, we've got cold weather on the way, or at least cool weather by northern standards. We're going to be in the 40s as a low uh, Thursday through Sunday. It's the longest cold stamp we've had yet. It's a gift from the heavens, and I'm not going to question it. So I'm going to put up with today. Uh, tomorrow it should start getting cooler, and the world will be a better place. We're also bird free. Not a single one on the wire watching us. No scouts up there. No flocks ready to come down and peck us to death. Uh, so uh, everything is nice in that regard. Thirdly, and uh, of course, bestly, if that's a word, it might be a Trump word. Uh, anyway, bestly is this 1990 Cadillac Brome de Elegance. I almost said Fleetwood, which had been a terrible mistake because it was not a Fleetwood in 1990, uh, even though a lot of people sort of think it is or say it is. This might be the favorite car of mine. This might be the greatest car I've ever reviewed. I know there's haters out there that, oh my God, they're going to stop watching the video and go post comments about what a piece of crap it is. Well, you know what? Go ahead. I don't care. To me, this was the pinnacle of the carness when I was you know, 19 or 20 years old. I loved this thing. Absolutely loved it. Uh, part of it being, of course, because I grew up in Naples, Florida, where the average age is, you know, I don't know, nursing home, deceased, whatever you want to say. And, uh, you know, was golfing by the time I was five and we all ate dinner early and drove slow in the fast lane. But uh, it, the Cadillac room, to me, this is the last of the truly great Cadillacs. It's, you know, it's got things in it that, you know, wouldn't have made it great by 70s or 60s standards. Doesn't matter. This is it. This is the last true proper Cadillac. Uh, I know they've made some fine cars afterwards, but they're not really Cadillacs. Not in the truest sense of the word uh, like this thing is. Uh, Cadillac itself is kind of an interesting cat. Uh, he was born in the, what, the 1700s. Antoine de la Sur de la Cadillac or something to that effect. Uh, he's the guy who founded Detroit and eventually, uh, you know, GM used his name or Cadillac used his name uh, for their cars even before GM bought it. Uh, what's interesting about that guy is he's a complete fraud. If you look up in the history books, they'll call him a scoundrel, which is a polite way of saying a liar, a cheat, and a fraud. Uh, you know, he came from fairly humble middle-class roots, uh, emigrated to Canada from France, and immediately discovered that unless he was some sort of a, you know, noble-born uh, yeah, aristocrat. He wasn't going to get anywhere. Nobody gave a crap about him. So when he got married to uh, the local governor's daughter, you know, that talk about a guy who's ambitious, he came up on his marriage certificate with this big, long, fancy name that he just made up out of whole cloth. I mean, the guy was the son of a low-level judge and a middle-class woman, but uh, by the time he wrote his name on the marriage certificate, he was, you know, owned half of France. And it actually worked very well for him. Oh, there's one who came in. Yeah, I knew it. I knew we weren't going to get away with none today. Looks like he's looking the other way for the moment. Anyway, he seemed to get away with it. It, it helped his career. He went to Maine or something, did pretty well there. And then, uh, you know, the, the governor said, go down. I had this, he had this idea. I'm going to found Detroit as a fur trading interway between here and New York. Well, it, it didn't really work. I mean, it was a good idea, but it turned out he was a pretty crappy manager. So uh, the guy who replaced him did a much better job of making Detroit into something. And they sent Antoine down to Louisiana, where he became a governor there, hated every Everybody, as much as they hated him. Uh, even the, uh, the Native Americans hated him because he wouldn't smoke a peace pipe with him. Uh, but anyway, everybody hated the poor guy, but he did fine. They, they took him out of Louisiana, sent him back to France. He bought his way into some town and, uh, you know, kind of ruled it until his death a few years later. So uh, anyway, interesting cat and who cares? We're, we're going to move on. Uh, the name Brome itself comes from a guy named Henry Brome, some sort of another British nobility, although I think he was proper uh, British nobility, not some guy who made it up. And uh, he had an enclosed uh, coach behind horses uh, that he called a brome or was called a brome after him. And uh, later on, when the, I think it was, it was at the Fisher Body Company,
company, uh, Fleetwood Body Company, they decided to start calling some of the cars that they were putting on platforms bromes, uh, which was originally a style where you had a closed in back for the wealthy fat cats and then an open chauffeur's compartment. So I absolutely love that. So the things driving around in the rain, you know, the chauffeurs up front, you know, dreaming of Bernie Sanders getting elected while the guys in the back are belly laughing and lighting their cigars off hundred dollar bills. It just seems cruel to me to have the chauffeur out in the open like that. But I guess it looked, uh, it looked nice for the guys in the back. Anyway, we're going to fast forward through all the many, many years of Cadillac Fleetwood Brome history and get to this one. Uh, this one, yeah, should it have existed? It's hard to say. When the Carter Malaise years came out, GM thought it was clever and decided they were going to downsize all their big cars, especially the Cadillacs. And that was going to be a tough sell uh, to some of the guys who really like Cadillacs. Never mind the livery companies with their limos and such. Uh, there's just a lot of rich old guys at the time who, you know, you know, wanted a proper rear drive big ass Cadillac and all of a sudden they get these little front drive turds. So GM's heart never really fully got into the front drive stuff. They kept this rear drive platform. Uh, in 77 they called it the D platform. It was exclusive to Cadillac. Then Reagan got elected. All of a sudden gas gets cheap. Everybody's happy and giggling again. Uh, so Cadillac fortunately had saved this thing and uh, they sold a bunch of them. Um, you know, they sold a bunch of the little front drive too, and the Seville's, which were expensive, but uh, they were crap, absolute crap, certainly compared to this thing. Uh, by the time uh, 89 rolled around, it needed a refresh because the town car had gone very aero, and uh, thus this particular style was born in 1990, where it got some, you know, kind of rounded edges, cladding along the bottom. Uh, these sort of composite European headlamps instead of the four quads up front. Uh, I debate myself as to whether I like the styling of the 89 or 90 better, uh, but uh, the truth is I just love both of them. I have no issue at all with either. Uh, absolutely, I think, gorgeous. Uh, construction of the thing was pulled away from Detroit and went to Texas, which was convenient because they could start putting bullhorns on the front of them, and uh, they pumped out quite a few of them until their demise in 1992. And in 93, they came out with this weird aerodynamic thing on the same platform. Some people will say that's the last great Cadillac, but I think that's horse crap. Uh, you know, I mean, it just didn't look like a Cadillac the way that this thing does. And uh, that's what's important to me. Uh, this particular one is a Brome d'Elegance. Now, people out there could make fun of that name. You know, oh my God, what a ridiculous name. What's an E300? I mean, is that even fun to say? Uh, it absolutely isn't. I mean, I am so mournful and longing of the Eldorados and the Fleetwood Bromes and the 60 Specials and all these great names that, you know, car companies used to have before German domination took over and everything became the CDX 1000. I mean, uh, this was, it, to me, a much more interesting car to say I have a Cadillac Brome d'Elegance than I have a Cadillac PDX, you know, it just doesn't work. Uh, you can see the big chrome bumpers, the vertical grill with intersectionality. I don't know, God, intersectionality, that means something to Democrats. Uh, you've got the wreaths and crest. You've got a real true, honest hood ornament. You've got an incredible liberal use of chrome everywhere. Uh, lovely body line swooping down the hood and back into the... Um, uh, speaking of intersectionality, so uh, our service shop has a guy in there, a good a friend of mine, I've known him for years, and he has recently decided that he is not happy being a guy, so he's decided to transition into femaleness, and I, you know, uh, I, obviously you support your buddies and the things that they do, even if you think it's a little bit strange. Uh, Andrew, the guy who owns the shop, was giggling about it. Absolutely, he was so happy. And I, you know, Andrew, uh, you know, surely this has to be a distraction at work. I mean, it, it can't, you know, make things. He said, man, it's fantastic. Not only am I gonna have the best lady mechanic, you know, in town, but I'm gonna get to pay her 72 cents on the dollar. So, eh, anyway, different priorities for different people. And of course, 
course, those are the kind of cats that bought these cars when they were new, uh, you know, driving around having fun with them. Uh, anyway, the chrome, stunning. Love the chrome on the bottom. Uh, this one had either, you know, factory installed real wire uh, rims or dealer installed wire rims. Most of these came with, uh, they were also optional, kind of bolt on wire hubcaps, basket caps, which were nice, but uh, not at all as beautiful as the true wires. They stuck out too far. Uh, you can see the chrome door handles. Uh, this is a very fancy vinyl roof on earlier models of this uh, rear drive Fleetwood Brome. This was a thousand dollar option. You know, on a car that cost in the 20s, that was expensive, uh, complete with the whole quarter window done in vinyl. Uh, by the time 90 rolled around, that became standard, uh, including kind of a dimmunized smaller back window with the padding around it. Uh, you see it as Brome d'Elegance. Uh, the script on the rear quarters, beautiful, lovely, uh, traditional Cadillac uh, tail, uh, tail lights uh, bumper. I mean, I just absolutely love this thing. I love looking at it. I love driving it. Uh, it's going to be very miserable for me to give this thing up. I've been looking for a good one of these for years. I wonder what was up with Antoine with his crest and the ducks. Now, obviously, he made the crest up, so, I mean, why pick a duck? There are no eagles around or something a little bit more exciting. Uh, of course, being an early Cadillac, or at least an early style Cadillac, it has an enormous trunk, perfect for the livery service or the mafia. Uh, you've got what appears to be a pretty tiny spare tire. Of course, that's the way GM was heading at the time. You've got a accessory Cadillac mat in there to keep your cargo padded and keep your trunk from getting a bunch of crap in it and uh, everything nice and lovely. On the bottom of the trunk is the build sheet of the car. It's uh, also going to illustrate that this is autumn maple uh, fire mist, that color, an optional expensive color, probably uh, to me the most beautiful of the 80s Cadillac colors. And of course your jacking instructions. Uh, the poor guy at uh, our service center isn't going to need those anymore. <laughs> Uh, anyway, you've got uh, a pull down on the uh, trunk, so if you just click it in place, sucks the trunk nicely closed. Uh, in traditional vintage Cadillac style, you've got your um, uh, gas, well, also Camaro style, I guess. But anyway, you got your gas door hidden behind the license plate. Lovely. Uh, you can see under this Cadillac script, you've got the 5.7 liter V8. Uh, that is an option in, in this car. Most of them had the 5 liters. They came standard with. Uh, to get the 5.7, you also had to opt for the trailering package, which made it kind of cool because you got some extra cooling stuff. Uh, and that uh, of course did give you more horsepower and that was a request from Cadillac customers to get more <clears throat> more juice under the hood. Uh, let's have a look under the hood. So this is all very debatable. I mean obviously everybody who buys one of these things would prefer to have the 5.7 because it's the most powerful but at the time this was essentially a uh, Chevrolet 350 truck motor that they put in these things and the guys who had been buying Cadillacs for 30 years were not happy They wanted their big cast iron block, you know 472 Cadillac motor that wouldn't rev very high, but was absolutely indestructible and uh, Having a 5.7 Chevrolet corporate GM uh, truck motor that you could also get in a this Silverado was just kind of annoying to them. There's Marty skulking off into work with his coffee. Actually, it looks fairly normal this morning, which is welcome change. Uh, anyway, everything is mint. This thing had 48,000 miles, this car. Absolutely mint. Uh, incredible find. I was so happy to find this. I bought it at a little collector car auction over the weekend. And I would have paid... $2 million. I would not have stopped bidding. You know, I just absolutely would not have stopped bidding. I had to have it, and I've got it now. And uh, you're, oh God, you're probably going to have to pry this for my cold, dead fingers. Anyway, there it is. You've got your uh, fuel-injected 5.7 liter. Very, very nice. Everything lovely under there. And, you know, we look back today and say what a great motor it is. It's made to that 4L64 speed, which was a great transmission. Really good driveline in this car. Uh, but at the time, the Cadillac purists were pretty upset. Miserable jerks, the same way the Porsche guys would have been if you water-cooled a 911. Get that back down. 
I just love the curvature of the hood uh, coming swooping around from the windshield when everything else is kind of straight and angular. Also love the wreaths and the crest, the Cadillac script on the grill. Ah, oh, it's just awesome. Chrome around the front windshield, chrome around the side windows. You've got these uh, opera lights or uh, whatever the hell you call them in the middle, nice little thin things. Uh, the condition of the chrome is epic in this car. And those wheels. Absolutely stunning. Okay, being the Delegance, you got a few extra bits and pieces when you ordered it. And one of them is you got this neat little script on all the door panels. Uh, also fantastically, and this is something I wish I saw in more cars, you have the uh, Cadillac logo and script on the door locks. That's something that's sorely missing from BMWs and Mercedes. Uh, you've got these fantastic little pockets in the back where you can, you know, stick your binders full of women or your Mac 10 or your, you know, H and K, whatever it is you need to stick back there, you're fine. And the Delegance, even though the seats are pretty great in the standard cars, you get these tufted, buttoned club style. You know, Chrysler tried to do this. They tried to do stuff like this, this pillowy leather stuff. They didn't get away with it. Everyone they built looked like a Cad, you know, a French whorehouse or something. Cadillac could do the same thing and uh, did a much better job of making it look like an, you know, kind of a British gentleman's club where they all sat around belly laughing and giggling, uh, making fun of the chauffeurs out in the uh, open air. Uh, you also got those aimable reading lights on the back corners in this uh, Delegance version. And it does have a fiber optic thing that runs to the rear and the front, uh, just like any old vintage Cadillac. Uh, that will tell you if your tail lights are on, parking lights on, and working. So nice feature. You also get an ashtray on the right, you get an ashtray on the left, you get your power window switch, all the stuff that people in the 70s needed, even though we've made it all the way to the 90s by this point. And uh, anyway, everything nice. Also this carpet, I can't remember what it's called, port, I can't, it doesn't matter. Anyway, real fancy optional carpet, lovely floor mats with nice grippies on the back to stay put, and uh, you do still, even to this day, get a lovely feeling of luxury in the back of this car. <clears throat> also not a bad place to consummate a relationship. Uh, okay, up front, same story. Beautiful Lazy Boy style leather seats right out of the British Gentleman's Club with the tufted leather pillows. Stunning. Uh, this was the last Cadillac made without airbags, so they had to move these uh, uh, seat belts over onto the door panels to make it past the safety standards of the time. Uh, you got these fantastic, you know, vintage style Cadillac power seats with power recline, forward, back, windows, locks, the famous little joystick mirrors, all the stuff that would have looked at home in a 1972 Cadillac, which is another reason I absolutely loved this car. Uh, what used to be body by Fisher was down here, but that's now been replaced by Brome. Fisher is an interesting company made by like eight or nine brothers. They had very prolifically mating parents. And uh, anyway, they built Cadillac bodies for many, many, many years. All right, let's hop in this thing. Okay, lovely thin steering wheel. You don't get this in Cadillac, so you get these big fat German style grippity things. This is proper American Cadillac stuff. Oh, let's fire it up. Lovely. I'm going to turn the radio down. Okay, uh, you do, of course, no airbag on this thing. It is a tilt wheel, so you can tilt it with that. This is a hard one-handed. It's also telescoping, so you can move that lever over like an old Corvette, move it forward and back. Pretty cool stuff. Put the seatbelt on. Uh, they added a digital instrument cluster as an option this year. Not even an option. I think it was a man. I don't know. Whatever. It's standard or optional. It's all the same. Uh, all to keep up with Lincoln and their now aerodynamic new town car. Uh, and I quite like the uh, digital instrument cluster. I think it works in this car. Nice little upgrade of modernity in what's a really old-fashioned piece. Uh, all these fantastic 70-0 wiper controls, headlight controls, Twilight Sentinel, uh, your uh, cruise control down here. Lovely vertical vents with chrome around them. Heaps and heaps of wood. This is probably the only car in world history that had warning lights behind faux wood trim. You see washer fluid there. I turn it on. You get all your stuff right behind the wood trim. I think that's really cool and uh, a neat uh, 
setup from Cadillac. Uh, this could be out of a 72 Corvette, this one. I mean, it's, oh God, it's so true old GM before everything changed. Uh, there's your cruise switch, nice stuff. Your column shifter, lovely. English metric, trip set, PRNDM indicator, all very nice stuff. Uh, over here, you've got uh, Cadillac's, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, in-dash infotainment at the time. Uh, basically, a radio and cassette deck. Are we out of And a nice way to listen to commercials in the morning. There you go. Another guy can take or leave, and I think he should have kept the Cougar. Made more sense. Uh, no, not his wife, the, uh, the middle name. Uh, down here, you've got your right side mirror control. You've got your electronic climate control. You've got another bona fide ashtray in the car, so your smokers are going to be happy. More Cadillac script up in the dashboard. Uh, if I can lean over here and open this, look at the Brome Delegant script on the. Love it. We've got our demonstration cassettes with the books, trunk release. Oh my God. What a cool piece. In the center, you've got uh, an actual cup holder. Uh, that would have been a new feature in Cadillacs at the time or any cars. And they just didn't put cup holders and things really until the late 1980s. Americans did more than the Germans, but uh, anyway, there it is. Nice little thing. And of course, when you put this back, uh, the front now becomes a three seater, has uh, seat belts for three. So you can fit six people inside. Over here, you've got a self-dimming mirror. Nice stuff. Uh, your uh, little place you could put your, um, I don't know what the hell you call it, your garage door opener in there. I don't remember exactly how it worked. I think this button, maybe it would push something down. Eh, it doesn't matter anyway. You could put a garage door opener in there, and they give you these nice big lit up vanity mirrors so your lady friend can powder her nose. And look at that expansive hood with the big wreath and crest leading the way. Epic. And this car was bigger than the town car. Cadillac really gave it up when they gave this thing up. What a shame. Uh, love the uh, fender uh, light indicators. That matches the rear so you can tell when your headlight signals are on, high beams, that kind of thing. Again, straight out of the 1950s. Effortless steering, of course, buttery, buttery smooth out of that thin wheel, over assisted, uh, full frame car, so you feel basically nothing, it just crushes the road underneath you. Uh, you drive it like a yacht, and then that is, you don't really steer the car down the road, you aim it at a point in the distance and just give it light corrections until you make it there. Oh God, it's got this lovely little barely audible V8 grumble. See if any people are going to let us in or we'll take them out. Uh, nice torque out of that uh, that truck motor. And uh, of course, that's what was sorely missing in uh, these things the minute that the old Cadillac engines got replaced with that uh, 4100. Uh, first, they went to the um, uh, whatever the hell it was, the, uh, the 864 that it would, it would you know, sort of cut down on the number of cylinders to try to save gas. That was all from the Carter era. That was crap. They tried a diesel, which was a converted gas motor. Crap. They went to the HT4100. You know, it can be fine, but it was underpowered as hell. It would barely move this thing down the road. Uh, then they went to a 307 Oldsmobile, which was a pretty good motor, uh, but uh, just didn't have the torque to... Uh, to keep things going. And then finally, when they went to these corporate GM truck motors, uh, they got enough oomph to, uh, to move the car. I want to say this had 175 rated horsepower in 1990. And uh, it's plenty peppy for, listen to that thing. <laughs> the majority of people who were gonna drive it. Uh, you know, I remember when I got in my first uh, little Cadillac with the 4.5 in it or something. It had over 200 horsepower, I think. And you could smoke the front tires off it. And I thought, God, why are we giving this to Mr. and Mrs. Howell? <sighs> they just, they're not going to know what to do with it. They're going to crash into their garage door. The ride from this car is epic. Absolutely epic. I mean, you are floating down the road, completely detached from anything that I would call driver feel, and it's fine. Uh, you know, the smoothness on your rump of these tufted, button, clubby, British, stodgy seats are epic. Uh, you know, the response now from the gas pedal is pretty damn great because of that, um, 
that torquey truck motor and uh, it just goes down the road beautifully you know I had a good friend whose brother used to tow a 30 foot scarab with one of these a series of Cadillacs 75 77 79 like the last of the you know proper v8 uh, Cadillac engines uh, then he went on to um, uh, a 5 liter which didn't work very well then he went to the 57 which did and uh, it was just his pickup truck the thing would a lot of trucks wouldn't even pull that boat out of the ramp but his Cadillac did every time he used to tell people on the ramp who looked on in awe that it was a special four-wheel drive version special order right, we're gonna follow this uh, uh, what the hell do you call it? 57 Bel Air here with the four doors. There's a Cars and Coffee next door at this Ultimate Garages place, uh, which is a neat mixture in Naples of you know the red cars, your F40s and such, and then the uh, the weird old cats and strange British cars and a few Corvettes sprinkled in. So pretty neat place. Uh, anyway, I may run in there later on and get some Cars and Coffee. Actually, let's, well, let's take a quick drive through and see what's pulling in here. Just gonna do a little reconnaissance. We got the French flag up. That's going to be good for uh, Antoine de Cadillac. Somebody's got a got a Cuda in there. Very very nice. A pretty neat place. Not a bad neighbor to have, actually. Brazil. I don't know what kind of Brazilian cars we're celebrating. Uh, Mercedes of Naples has their stuff out. And uh, of course, the Brits are well represented. So, anyway, there it is. There's uh, Ultimate Garages. We got some Bentleys. We got some, what do we got there? McLarens, Ferrari, all very nice stuff. Go over there and get some Dunkin' Donuts and Hobnob with the people who make a lot more money than me and uh, light their cigars off $100 bills and pay women 72 cents on the dollar. So, uh, anyway, who cares? Back to the Cadillac. Incredible, incredible car. 40, uh, what is it, 48,000 miles on this thing. Loads of options. Brome d'Elegance. I love it. Love it. Go ahead in the comments. Tell me what a piece of crap it is. I don't care. I don't care. This thing is epic, and uh, you're going to have to convince me otherwise. So, uh, This one is for sale on our lot. If you have an interest, and you should, because it's the greatest car in the world, 239-298-8000. Uh, on the web at aenaples.com. Thank you so much for having a look. We really appreciate it. We'll see you with the next one. Take care.